<coughs> so most of what we're doing tonight is going to be on the command line. You can either uh, use a command line terminal directly. So if you remember from the first week, if you do control alt and then F2 through F6, it'll load up a command line terminal that you can log into and work in without ever running start X. Um, or if you prefer to click on things, you can just open up the terminal in the, uh, in the graphics environment itself. Sometimes the wireless client in the graphics environment will, like that program we ran to hit the wireless network, will interfere with what we're trying to do automatically. So you might be a little bit better off doing it headlessly, which would mean without ever running start X, just directly on the terminal. But you don't have to. Um, if you're not comfortable with the terminal text editor, you can do this all, you should be able to do everything in the desktop environment, and hopefully it works. So on Linux, network configuration is controlled in a number of different ways. There's a program called ifconfig, which if you run it, will spit out your current network configuration. And mine's running off the screen here, so I'm going to make it so I can scroll through it. Um, so you're going to see a number of things. Assuming you guys all have Wi-Fi adapters connected, you should see three different stanzas within the output of this program. One will be called eat0, one will be called lo, and one we call WLAN zero. What these are is each one of these stanzas or, or paragraphs uh, corresponds to one of the network interfaces on your Linux machine. The loopback interface is a special interface that doesn't actually have, I mean, it's not like an actual wireless antenna, it's not like an actual place where you plug in a cable. It's an internal network interface, so if you have two network programs running on the same machine, they can talk to each other. It doesn't actually have any physical embodiment. But both WLAN 0 and ETH 0 are referred to the two physical connectors. So ETH 0 is for Ethernet 0. That refers to the actual physical Ethernet plug on your board. WLAN 0 refers to your wireless card. My antenna is bigger than yours. But um, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> So you should, uh, you should be able to see all three of these things. If you didn't have your wireless card connected, you would just be ETH0 and loop back. You wouldn't have this WLAN0. Uh, mine has a little bit of extra info, depending upon what you guys have connected to right now. I'm actually plugged into the Ethernet as well as the Wi-Fi, just because I'm remotely connected to this right now, so I need the backups when I shut down the Wi-Fi to demo it doesn't crash my machine. Um, so we'll look at this more in a minute, but essentially what each of these tells us is it's giving us some information. We really just care about the first few lines, but it's telling us what address I currently have on the network. It's telling me some information about the network, and then it's a bunch of statistics down underneath here. Um, so if you've already connected to the wireless network, you would have an IP address here. Right now I'm not connected to the wireless network. That's why there's no IP address. You'll notice the IP address line and stuff is missing. So I'm not currently connected to the wireless. I am currently connected to the Ethernet. Depending upon what you are or are not connected to, yours may look a little bit different. Um, essentially, we can also use this program to change the network config on the fly. Uh, if we ran ifconfig, the name of some interface, so like WLAN0, we could then assign IP addresses, all of that. We're not actually going to do it that way, because when you do something with ifconfig, your changes aren't persistent. They only exist until you reboot. Uh, we want our changes to be permanent, so every time we reboot, they stay the same. So what we actually do is there's a configuration file, like most things on Linux. This is all controlled via just a text file. There's a configuration file that ifconfig reads when you boot up, and it basically gets all of its defaults out of that file, runs them when you boot up, and then if you want to change something after that, you can use the actual ifconfig command. So, is so everyone totally lost? All right. So the file we want to edit, uh, the default on Linux file system organization is there's always this slash etc folder. So again, slash is just the root. So this is the base of our file system. So in the top tree of our file system, there's always a folder called etc. Inside that are the configuration files for everything on the entire machine. So we're going to deal with the network configuration file, but pretty much every other configuration file you could ever need to touch is somewhere inside this etc directory. Uh, <laughs> if I just look at it, I mean, it's a big directory, it has a lot of stuff in it. Like I said, it's config for pretty much everything. What we care about is the network config, which on Debian derived Linux installs like this, uh, so Ubuntu uh, would be the same way, is in the nicely labeled network folder. So if we do, if we look inside this network folder, we actually have a series of files in here, and the one we're going to care about is this interfaces file. This is what holds all of the static configuration, or dynamic for that matter. It holds the boot up configuration for the network on our machine. So we want to edit this file. Uh, I'm going to use Emacs. You can use the text editor of your choice, you know, gedit, uh, nano, vim, etc. 
So in order to edit this file, we have to be root because this is a system file. So you need to put sudo in front of whatever editor you're opening. And then the file I want, like I said, is slash etsy slash interfaces. So, I'm sorry, slash etsy slash network slash interfaces. So don't actually change this file yet because there's one thing I forgot to do and we'll go back to it. But if we just look at this file, yours is probably <coughs> looks a little bit different because I've made some minor modifications to mine. But kind of like the IF config, it, it may not be formatted this way. You're welcome to reformat it. White space doesn't matter. Um, but it has essentially three stanzas like we did before. One referring to that loopback interface. That's just the built-in one. One referring to my Ethernet connection. And again, one referring to my Wi-Fi connection. By default, you see you have this auto line. That just tells the computer to automatically start this interface when it boots up. So anything that's started with an auto in front of it automatically gets, it says, turn on the Ethernet when I boot up, turn on the Wi-Fi when I boot up. So we need the auto line there. Um, you may not have it for WLAN 0 because Hot Plug actually does the same thing. Hot Plug's unique to like USB devices that you can plug in and out. It's just saying, don't only start it when the computer B boots up, but also automatically start it anytime someone plugs it in. So if you plugged in your Wi-Fi after booting, that's what would automatically turn it on. So these first line, this first line, or in this case, these first two lines just deal with automatically turning on that network interface when it's either connected or when the computer boots. Down below that, you have this one line, and this is the line that kind of configures how your address gets configured. So you'll notice for my Ethernet right now, it says DHCP. So it's telling it to automatically configure, ask the network for the configuration information uh, for ETH0. The Wi-Fi is kind of a special case. It has this manual here, and we're actually going to change this in a sec. But manual's actually saying there's another program that's going to configure the Wi-Fi for me. It's called WPA Supplicant. It dates back to the fact that Wi-Fi didn't originally exist when Linux came around, so we've kind of had to write some additional programs to deal with it. Um, so this is saying IF config shouldn't deal with the Wi-Fi at all. Instead, I want WPA Supplicant to deal with it, and it's going to be configured via this file. We're actually going to configure it here directly, so we're going to effectively ignore this file when we come back in here. This file is a roaming profile. What it's useful for is if you're doing this on like a laptop or a situation where you need to move your computer between multiple wireless networks, like you have one wireless network at home that you want it to automatically connect to, you have another wireless network at school that you want it to automatically connect to, and you want it just to automatically connect anytime your computer finds one of those wireless networks. This is essentially a file where you can just list all of those networks, the preference. It's similar to how you would do it in Windows or something. Because we're setting this up as a server, we're going to assume it's only going to be sitting in one place, and thus it only ever needs to know about. We can just hard code a single network. It doesn't need to be clever and know that it should find whatever network it can currently see. Um, so we're not going to use this file because it complicates things a little bit. But if you did want to set it up so your Raspberry Pi could connect to multiple networks, depending upon if you were at your house or at your school or something like that, you would actually change the configuration in this file instead of doing what we're about to do. Questions? Okay, so I said we forgot to do something. Uh, so go ahead and close that file. Um, what we forgot to do is before you change the network configuration, it's always a good <laughs> idea to actually shut down the interface for whatever configuration you're gonna change. Otherwise, you, you're really, really gonna break something, but you might make it so you have to reboot the entire system if you make a change without shutting it down first. Um, so the command to shut down a wireless interface is, uh, there's actually two ways to do it. We can use the ifconfig command. So we need to be sudo if you want to actually make changes. So sudo ifconfig, then the name of the interface. So assuming we're going to go change the config for the Wi-Fi interface, that's what we want to shut down. So we're going to say sudo ifconfig wlan0. So we're going to do something wireless, and we want to bring it down. So if you just type in the word down, that should execute. And if everything works correctly, there shouldn't be any errors. Um, if I run ifconfig now, well, so mine doesn't actually change because it was never connected. But if you used to have an IP address here, your IP address would be gone now. You've essentially disconnected the wireless. There's the command again. People missed it. Yes? And then you could use IP to set the next step that we went down. Sure. So I, haven't, I don't have all my IP commands memorized. Um, I have configs actually going out of style. We're working on removing it. There's a new program called IP that replaces it that has similar syntax, but not exactly. You can go read the man page if you want all the dirty details. But 
If I were making this, teaching this class like five years from now, we'll probably all be using IP instead of IFConfig, but the concept's the same. They do all the same things. IP is just a replacement, slightly different syntax. Uh, the other way you can do this, there's actually a shortcut just called IF down, where all you have to type in is the name of the interface. So that does, this is just a shortcut for we just ran. This actually expands to IFConfig WLAN0 down. So we've shut down the interface. Are people good on that? So let's go ahead and open that file back up again. And now we can actually make our changes. So if you look on the, I, I put notes on the website, and the changes you need to make are on there, or you can just copy me. Uh, although if someone's looking at the website and I screw this up, you should keep me honest, because I'm you know, just memorizing what needs to go here. So like I said, we're, we're going to make a number of changes. I'm actually not going to erase these lines. I'm just going to comment them out in case we ever want to go back to them. So in most configuration files, they follow bash programming syntax. So anything that, any line that starts with a, uh, with a number sign is commented out. So I'm going to comment out those three lines and space between them. So we still want these two lines. They're fine. That's the same turn on automatically when you boot or when you plug it in. We now want another version of this line. But instead of it being manual, we're going to type in the word static. So this is telling us we're going to just, it's kind of confusing. This is actually saying we're going to statically specify all of the network config here. So it's, you might think it's what should be called manual because we're manually configuring it. Um, but the word is static as opposed to DHCP or manual. Uh, so we put the word static there. Now you don't have to use the, uh, you don't have to tab in here, but you know, it's good practice. Uh, now everything underneath this is going to essentially be the configuration that we want to give it. So this is going to be the configuration it uses on boot. Because this is a wireless interface, the first two things we have to do is tell it what Wi-Fi network to connect to, and if that Wi-Fi network has a password, we need to give it that. Uh, so these two lines are unique to a Wi-Fi interface. If we were doing this on ETH0, we could do the same thing. We could change this to static. Uh, we would just skip these first two lines. Everything else would be the same. But because this is wireless, we need to a couple of lines. So. Uh, there's a setting called WPA-SSID. Is anyone actually looking at the website? Yes, WPA-SSID. So, WPA-SSID, the argument of which is whatever the name of the network you want to connect to is. Our network's called RPI Testnet with that capitalization. You don't necessarily need them, but it's a good idea to put this kind of stuff in quotes just in case it ever had a space is when that would make a difference. So RPI testnet, that's cool. Then I have to give it the password. So WPA-PSK, PSK. PSK stands for pre-shared key. That's what we just call Wi-Fi. It's the technical name for a Wi-Fi password. It's not really a password, it's a pre-shared key. So in this case, we need the password, which for this network is Internet Pi with a capital I, capital P, no spaces. I hope I'm doing this all right. I didn't actually test it today. Okay. So those are the two lines that are specific to Wi-Fi. If we weren't doing Wi-Fi, um, we wouldn't have these two lines. The rest of these lines are good for any network interface. So if we were doing this on Ethernet, we would just skip these two lines. The rest would be the same. So we need an IP address, which is the address command. So we just type in the word address. And now we give it an IP address. Without diving too deep into everything that's going on in the networks here, um, this network that I set up has an IP addresses that all start with 192.168.0.x, where the x is what changes. So Everyone will have an IP address that starts with this. You could all just go randomly pick an IP address, but like I said, if two of you pick the same one, it's going to cause problems. So, who's borrowing one of my Raspberry Pis? Go ahead and raise your hand. So if you're borrowing a Raspberry Pi kit, your IP address should just be um, a one followed by your kit number. So if your kit number one, you'd be 101. If your kit number three, you'd be 103. If your kit number 11, you'll be 111. Make sense? If you're, who's not borrowing a Raspberry Pi from me? Okay, so you get 112, 113, and 114. And that's how we do conflict resolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everyone go ahead, for your address, put that in. My address is actually going to be a little bit different. Yes? Uh, the kit is 0413-XX. 
Oh yeah, so you, what you care about is right, the last two, okay. the last two digits. The first part's just the date that we bought it. So it's 168 dot last two digits, right? Yep, 192.168.0.1 oh, okay. oh. and then whatever two digits I gave you. So this is either your kit number or it's whatever I just told you. So all of you should have stuff in the 100 category. No one should have something that's lower than 100. Except me. I have dot three three. So yours would not look like this. Yours would look like this, where X and Y are, you know, either your kit number or whatever number I told you. Okay. So the next line we need, and actually the order of these lines doesn't matter. Um, we need something called the net mask. Your network needs a way to determine what's on the local network and what's out in the wider internet. And the net mask is essentially how we do that. So I said everything on our network starts with 192.168.0. So everything that doesn't start with that is part of the internet as far as it is like stuff elsewhere. It's not on the local network here. So the way we tell the computer that is by using something called a net mask which in this case is going to be 255.255.255.0. Those of you that like your binary will realize that if you look at these in binary, where each of these is one byte, uh, one byte in decimal, so this would be eight ones, eight ones, eight ones, this would be something different. But if you and those together, what we'd essentially get is we get this back out, and it's always going to be a dot zero here. And that then tells it that the network is it's basically saying these three numbers are always going to be the same. This last number is what's going to change if you're on the local network. Anything that doesn't match these three numbers is part of the internet and you need to go elsewhere to find it. So you could just type it in, but if you care about knowing what it means, there you go. So if we wanted to expand our network, right now our network's limited to 254 people because .255 and .0 are reserved. So if we had more than 254 people in here, we'd run out of addresses. We would need to go to using this digit as well, and if we wanted to do that, we'd make this a zero. So if we made this a zero, then we suddenly buy ourselves, you know, 254 times 254 instead of just 254 addresses. So we buy ourselves a lot more addresses, and then you guys could both these digits would mean on our local network. Right now, if you put something like a one here, your computer is going to think that's outside the local network, and it's going to send that request out to the internet. So how do we how are we assign the the first seven so yeah, there's some rules. Um, everything that starts with 192.168 is dedicated as like for local use. So you can do whatever you want with it. Um, I mean, if you were like CU, you would have some rules within CU. But like, if you go to your house, your house probably has a 192, like your home network in your house starts with 192.168. When we've designed the internet numbering scheme, we said we're just going to reserve these blocks for people's like home networks. Um, these addresses aren't actually available on the internet. Like if I went to my house right now and typed in one nine and tried to connect to 192.168.0.33, if I tried to connect to this address right here from my house, I wouldn't get to here. Uh, I might get to another computer that has that address like on my local network if I happen to be using the dot zero scheme, but I wouldn't, it wouldn't actually connect across the internet. So because this is our own network, I can do whatever I want, right? I can make this zero. If I was coordinating with all of CU because we were all using one big unified network, there'd be more coordination. Um, but yeah, within this range, it's all up to you. Other questions? We can go into the details of you know internet numbering if people care later, but it's not all that relevant. Um, okay, so the final piece of information we need is something <coughs> called a gateway. Like we said, the net mask is basically tells us what's on the local network and thus can be connected to directly and what's not. The gateway is where everything that's not on the local network goes. So the gateway is just the address of some device on your network that is connected both to your local network and is connected to the internet. So basically, if you need to find something that isn't on the local network, so something outside of 192.168.0, if I need to find like 8.7.6.5 or something, that's not on my local network. It then sends that to the gateway. The gateway forwards it out to the wider internet where hopefully someone else knows how to find it. So in this case, the gateway is the Wi-Fi router up here. Uh, many of you that have Wi-Fi around your house will work the same way. It's a router, it's a gateway, it's actually doing a lot of different things. But this is connected via this cable to the campus network. So for us, the gateway is the portal between our local network and the campus network. 
the campus network that connects us to the internet, but the campus network is the internet as far as we're concerned. It's the next hop further outside. So the IP address of our gateway, and this is pretty standard convention, is you use the lowest IP address on your local network. So .0.1 dot this case, I mean, it can be whatever you want. This is just good convention. If you have to guess on what the gateway is on a local network, you just pick the lowest address. Uh, and we can look at the config later, but that's the address that I, when I set up this router, I just programmed in that address in here. So I just said you are 192.168.0.1, and that's also where I told it we're going to use 255.255.255.0, and we're going to use 192.168.0 as the base. So questions on what these three lines do? So you don't actually need the gateway line, but without the gateway line, you won't be able to connect to anything outside the local network. So if we left off the local, if we left off the gateway line, you guys would all be able to connect fine to my Raspberry Pi up here, but you wouldn't be able to connect to Google, um, or so on and so forth. So if you realize that you can connect to things on the local network, but you can't get out to the internet, one of the common problems is your gateway's wrong. So um, we'll put this line in here. It doesn't actually do anything because we don't have the software that uses it installed on the Raspberry Pi, but it's not a bad idea and because I have it on here. So there is one more piece of information that it's useful to specify here, and that's what we call um, the DNS name servers. So thus far we've been talking in terms of IP addresses, but you guys use the internet and you all know no one visits Google by going to 8.8.5.34, right? You visit Google by going to google.com. Um, so what we need is whenever you specify something like google.com, someone has to tell you what the corresponding IP address is because the internet actually works on IP addresses. So your DNS servers are computers out on the internet that translate DNS names like google.com to the corresponding IP address. Um, there's tons of them. You can use kind of whatever you want. If you like, you know, have Comcast at your house, Comcast tells you the addresses for some DNS servers that they provide. You're welcome to use theirs. It really doesn't matter whose you use. Uh, Google provides public ones that are pretty fast and they don't do anything funny. So uh, I like to use theirs. So theirs are 8.8.8 .8 .8 and 8.8.4.4. The only reason there's two here is just a backup. So if for some reason the server went down, I would still have a backup here. This line here is great, but like I said, it doesn't actually do anything on the Raspberry Pi. We could install the software that does it. Um, we'll actually need to specify these in another file, but that's kind of old school. This is the proper way to do it on like a new machine today that wouldn't be the Raspberry Pi. You specify these here so it's all in one place. It used to be that this information always went in a separate file, but then you had to configure two separate files to get your network set up. It was kind of a pain. So we've moved it here. The Raspberry Pi just hasn't been updated yet. So we'll put it here in the hopes that someday when the Raspberry Pi gets updated, it'll actually matter. Right now, this line just gets ignored. So questions on any of this? So this should be everything we need now. Um, and looking over for errors real quick. Uh, if we save the file now, and close the file. So now when we bring our WLAN 0 interface back up, it should come up using those settings. So we will test this. Uh, if it doesn't work, you may need a reboot. We shut it down first, which should help with a lot of issues, but not always. So if you run the command sudo if up, which again is just a shortcut for if config space up, uh, we need to tell it WLAN 0. Oh, failed. So I'm, I probably need to reboot mine. Yes. If you guys get an error message like this, it means reboot it. Just, you can't always switch things like this on the fly, especially if you booted the desktop already. Um, so I'm going to reboot mine real quick. OK. While mine reboots, we'll see if, when it comes back up. Is it working for anyone? Cool. My work. Okay, so once you reboot, if you run IF config again, if everything went according to plan, you'll now have the IP address I gave you here. So this is the IP address that I used. Um, if you don't have this, then something's going wrong and we should take a look. So raise your hand if you've made it this far. Okay, that's a start. And are the rest of you, is there a problem or are you just waiting for it to finish rebooting? <laughs> so the first thing you want to look at here, I'll bring up my configuration file again, is make sure your configuration matches mine. Okay. 
Okay. So, this is the working config. Your only difference will be you guys will all have individual IP addresses. Okay, so the next thing we're going to change as soon as people are done looking at this momentarily is, like I said, it's not actually using this line, so there is this one other file we have to go change. Uh, the name of the file is actually slash etc. Uh, slash resolve.conf, R-E-S-O-L-V dot C-O-N-F. If I'm getting it right, I'll pull it up here in a sec. If you want to open that file, um, you're welcome. You can probably figure out the changes that need made. There's a line that says name server on it. I think you can only do one per line in there. So you'd have a name server line and then 8.8.8, .8 .8, then another one, 8.8.4.4. You can actually erase all of the lines that are currently in the file. You don't need any of them or, or comment them out. But I'll open that up as soon as they're done typing this in, in case me explaining text files to you isn't you know, something that works for you. This is also on the website. It just doesn't have these actual numbers in it. Cool. And do make sure you have the dashes here. If you leave out the dashes, it breaks. As the person who actually found out. Okay. So, like I said, there's another file we can edit. So I'm going to need sudo emacs slash etc. and resolve.conf. So this file, like I said. On a modern day system, you won't edit this file manually. It gets automatically generated a boot up based upon whatever your settings are in the other file. <coughs> but as we're seeing now, this clearly has not been automatically generated because it doesn't say 8.8.8.8 like it should. Uh, so we're just going to manually change this. You can actually lose the search and domain lines. They're not actually relevant. But what we do want is the name server line. And we're going to put in two of them, although really the first one's all we should need. So these are Google's name servers again. You can use whatever name servers you like, but unless you have. Where was this file again? This is slash etc. slash resolve dot com. Oh. So slash etsy slash resolv dot conf. And you will need to be root at this as well. So if you make this file look like this and then close it, life should be good. And because we changed this before I demonstrated the error that would occur, you're not going to know why this was important. Did you comment on all the uh, call adder and EDU domains? I just deleted them. Oh, okay. So whatever you currently have in this file will actually reflect last time you did a DHCP request, which is why if you have the Colorado stuff, it's because you were connected to the Colorado network earlier. Um, I had the stuff for this network because I was connected to it earlier, so on and so forth. Are people good? Can I close this? Did you reboot after changing your iPad config, or you can reboot now, actually? Yeah, I just waited for it to reboot. I was wondering when we go to get that file. Uh, so it's right here. Slash Etsy, slash resolve.com. And you'll need to be pseudo-dead. <coughs> 